Hi, welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, recording from the tiniest podcast studio outside of Boston. And today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about a frisky feline who left her paw prints all over history, a mutt who was promoted to sergeant World War I, and a snake who sent a man to a hospital hours after the snake was beheaded. Yes, you heard that correctly. Beheaded. All right, let's go. Y'all, we got a long episode ahead of us. We're going to talk about a lot of interesting things, but I do have to address the elephant in the room. My husband, we do live in a tiny apartment. We live in about 800 square feet, one floor. Uh, There are three humans, including an eight-year-old who's homeschooling right now because of COVID-19. Not homeschooling. It's uh, remote learning. And I'm working and doing all of my activities from my bedroom, which is now my office, which is weird. And my husband has the office, and he also plays trumpet. So you may hear some trumpet throughout today's recording. Um, He will be serenading you from the other side of the apartment. But because we do live in small spaces, like I'm sure many of you guys can relate to, we're doing the best we can with the tools we have. So you'll actually get to hear as to what it's like in the McGrath household. But we do still have a long episode ahead of us. And we are going to talk about, finally, talk about... One of my very favorite stories ever. It is Sergeant Stubby, the only dog who has been promoted to sergeant by way of combat in war. He was the first historical animal that I had ever learned about after the dogs that ran the gnome run for mercy that we talked about a couple weeks ago. And this is a story that I knew the broad strokes of before researching it, and I became even more impressed the more I looked into Sergeant Stubby and the implications of having war dogs promoted in the media. Not everything is as good as it seems, it turns out. And we're also going to gloss over in the third segment about the cutest little danger noodles. So if you are cripplingly afraid of snakes, don't worry. I am going to give a content warning when we do get to that segment. It turns out a third of adults report to have a snake phobia, making it the most common reported phobia. And if that many adults have this phobia, I am positive kids listening might also be worried. So... It's okay, guys. Don't worry. We are going to do a nope rope content warning when we get there. So sit back and relax and enjoy the story of Sergeant Stubby. But first. Let's go back to Croatia. No, we are not going all the way back to the bomb bees in episode one, but we are going to go back in time. And if you could hop into a time machine today and go back to about the 1400s, you would see a moment in time preserved by a frisky little kitty and forgotten about for 600 years. Fast forward to 2012 when Emir O. Filopovic, a research assistant, was going through some old historic texts. And this can understandably be boring if it's not, quote, your thing hours of scanning pages as you just can't use like the command find function in old timey texts to see exactly what it is that you're looking for. And translating older versions of languages might be very difficult. Think of Shakespeare. He's still English, but if you were to read it today, some of those jokes might get lost. But there is one thing that transcends language and time. Jerk cats. So while Emiro Filopovic was searching these old pages, he came across a meticulous writing from a person with, well, let's be honest, much better handwriting than most perfectly straight quillmanship, curly letters flourishing beautifully below the invisible lines marking each line of text. And smack in the middle of this old-timey text, this archaic writing that no doubt took hours to complete, were the paw prints from a perfectly timed pounce. Given the evidence on the pages, the cat had first knocked over an ink jar, coating his or her paws, and then pounced on the drying pages. According to SmithsonianMagazine.com, quote, the photo of the cat paw prints represents one such situation which forces the historian to take his eyes off from the text from the moment, to pause and recreate in his mind the incident when a cat, presumably owned by the scribe, pounced first on the ink container and then on the book, 
branding it for the ensuing centuries. You can almost picture the writer shooing the cat in a panicky fashion while trying to remove it from his desk. Despite his best efforts, the damage was already complete and there was nothing else he could have done but turn a new leaf and continue his job. Basically, all of that is to say this jerk cat knocked over some ink, got his feet all yucky, and then jumped on this guy's writing. And since the guy was probably in a hurry, this cat jumped on the pages of history, and instead of redoing the page because it took a ton of work, he just kept going. And so when Emir found it centuries later, we can all look at it and laugh at it. And if you do get a chance to look at the links in the description, you will see pictures of these big paw prints in this archaic text. And it's, it's just so comforting to see that cats have always been walking across our keyboards, or the older equivalents, ever since we've had cats. So how many of you have heard of Sergeant Stubby, the most decorated war dog of World War I? Many more in the last few years, as he is another hero who has had a movie made about him in very recent history, and we're going to talk about that at the end of this segment. But he's been one of my very favorites for a long time. So let's do a deep dive. Sergeant Stubby just stubby back then, was a puppy wandering Yale University. And he wasn't really an impressive sight. He was short, barrel-shaped, a bit homely with brown and white brindle stripes. I feel seen. One of the soldiers, Corporal James Robert Conroy. Some accounts call him James, others Robert, so I'm just going to call him by his full name for the duration of this piece. Corporal James Robert Conroy took him in. But they were soon inseparable. And I think many of us who have ever been in such a position to find a dog, cat, pet, orphan, squirrel, whatever, might know this feeling intimately. Corporal Conroy was successful in hiding Stubby for a few months during training camp, but sneaking him to Europe was going to be much, much harder. See, dogs weren't allowed to be in the military. Weird today, if you think about it, but at the time, they weren't allowed. Stubby was on the boat to France during the war and went across the ocean undetected. Boats took weeks to cross the Atlantic. And then he was hidden in Conroy's jacket. And when Conroy's commander finally found out about Stubby, and in some articles it said he was discovered on the SS Minnesota crossing the Atlantic, others say it was coming off the boat. But either way, this little dog was eventually found. And instead of getting kicked out of the army, this little dog saluted as if he were a soldier. And so he was allowed to stay in the unit as a mascot. And that was the plan. Stubby as their mascot, until he went to the trenches in her stripes as a legitimate soldier. But when the First World War started, the United States was one of the very few nations representing who did not have canines on the front lines. To be honest, it appears that we also didn't have an army in the sense that we know it today. The United States's General John Pershing famously said, We came into this war without an army. So we must now build an entire new organization. Compare that to France, to Belgium, to Russia, to Germany, to Britain. They all used and understood the importance of dogs and how they could be used in battle to great advantage. And unfortunately, the idea at the time was that the only dogs allowed on the field were purebred. Only they would do. And I am going to say this as the training director of the oldest AKC, American Kennel Club, Obedience Club in the United States. The idea that only purebred dogs would do. Uh, that's, mm, hmm. Where is my swearing parrot when I need him? <coughs> Never mind, I'll do this myself. That is absolutely bunk. German Shepherds, Airedales, Chien de Brie, and Siberian Huskies were all used for different functions in World War I. They were able to send messages, transportation, guarding, alerting, all of it. Even sanitary dogs or Red Cross dogs who would run out into no man's land. The area between the two battling forces to look for wounded or dead. These dogs had water and medical supplies strapped to their backs and pockets on their vests to get supplies to the wounded. These dogs were all purebred and bore the giant Red Cross symbol on their equipment and bodies, so they were not allowed to be shot at by either party. Geneva Convention for the win. And if dogs couldn't get there in time to save someone, they were at least a warm body and a friendly face to see in the moments before death. Comfort and companionship to dying soldiers, man's best friend indeed. So Stubby, a mutt, 
and a mutt not unlike the mutt in my house right now. My mutt, who found our landlord's missing cat, our neighbor's missing insulin, and helped my daughter learn to read because he sat there patiently. He didn't judge her as she learned to make sounds out of words without people in the room to correct her every mistake, who offers her comfort in the time of COVID when she is having a bad day because she misses her friends. And he's here with her every step of the way. A dog who taught kids at the Museum of Science, quote, just a mutt who can and does everything a purebred dog can do except for win a beauty contest or maybe herd sheep because honestly, that's not his jam. And so Stubby, the mutt mascot who snuck into the war in a coat of his American corporal, is rather poetically perfect to be that first dog in the war for the Americans. Unpedigreed, untrained, unrefined. And he did it all. Stubby was hit by grenades and moved to the area where injured soldiers healed. And once he did heal, he came right back into the trenches with the men. One month into the trenches in France, and Stubby's unit was seeing the most action of any other unit in the war. More fighting than any other division. And this dog stayed with his men the entire time. The colonel was reported to be an imposing expert in wartime, and while he, a machine gun tactician, was the one who ordered that Stubby stay with the men in the trench. And the joke was that Stubby was the only member of the regiment that could talk back to the colonel and get away with it. Stubby earned his first rank, Private. Private Stubby? Who? that's unfortunate. Private Stubby earned his rank by running up and down the trench, waking the soldiers as he could smell and hear mustard gas attacks approaching when the exhausted men slumbered in the dirt in the long hole in the ground. They were able to wake up and get their gas masks on before being poisoned by the air, thanks to Stubby's advance notice. And not only was he able to warn his platoon about incoming attacks, he was also able to find wounded men on the field after battle and alert for help, getting urgent medical attention to those in need, just like the pedigree dogs in the other units. There is even a story that Stubby had run out into the middle of a field and grabbed a German soldier by the butt and refused to let go until he ended up with reinforcements of the men on his side. That's what earned him his stripes. Maybe. And as a result of all of these stories reported in prestigious papers like the New York Times, they all highlighted the bravery of this tough little dog, but it also did something else. It is important to notice that something shows like this, bewilderbeasts, stories, even satire, they all put a lens on something that is incredibly hard to consume and deal with, like an Instagram filter. These stories, they allow the reader, the listener, the participant to get the information, often heartbreaking or challenging information in an easier to digest way. But while these exploits make the dog nothing less than a celebrity, he was able to meet three sitting presidents. Stubby traveled the nation to veterans' commemorations, and he performed in vaudeville shows. It is hard to justify the dog, earning $62.50 for three days of theatrical appearance. Today, that doesn't seem like much. But in World War I, that was more than twice the weekly salary of the average American at the time. It is understandable that when you have issues that deal with the humanity of war, or lack thereof because war is inhumane by definition, those men who fought felt like they were second fiddle to Stubby. And Stubby got attention in the New York Times and in other papers, and men were getting shot and died, and some came home with missing limbs and emotional and psychological issues. They couldn't get work. They couldn't get help, in part because, let's be honest, mental health wasn't something that the army and similarly hierarchical outfits like police forces don't believe in or trust. That if you couldn't walk it off, champ, you are less of a man, which undoubtedly made many of these soldiers' emotional wounds fester and worsen. So if you were a soldier who kept reading about a hero dog and not the hero men who gave so much, it might start to wear on you. That maybe you weren't as worthy as just an animal. That your story, what you left behind on the battlefield, was somehow less valued than that of a mascot in the trenches. And if you were a person who is dealing with mental health issues and trauma, this might be impossibly hard to overcome without help help that was not valued at the time. And luckily, we know a lot more now, and there are bigger pushes for people, even kids, to get professional help. 
My degree in college was in psychology, and even in the nearly 20 years since getting that degree, this field has grown exponentially. Many of my friends and colleagues and family members and kids have found professional help, and there are ways to get it, even in COVID times. And with the advent of Zoom, you can reach out and find someone to talk to and help you if you are overwhelmingly sad with COVID restrictions or if your parents are getting a divorce and you need help. If you feel sad all the time or even angry or if you're a kid who needs to come out of the closet, if you are confused and need something, anything at all, there are places that you can go for help and lots of people can legitimately help you. There is no shame in finding help when you need it. And I wish these men back then knew that someday there would be help for them. But there wasn't. So in a way, Stubby was a mascot of the war when he started. And when he came back, he became a mascot of our spirit. Fighting, winning, American spirit. But mascots aren't enough. We need to find the humanity. And that was something Stubby could not do on his own. So after the war, Stubby again found himself in the role as mascot. This time for Georgetown University. James Robert Conroy, his owner, the man who found him, cared for him, shared his rations with him, and fought alongside him in World War I, went to Georgetown University to attend law school. And again, Stubby tagged along wherever Conroy went and raised morale for the students. Stubby learned to push a football at halftime to get the crowd cheering and everyone involved, and this became the custom for Georgetown. If you happen to watch college football, Georgetown University's mascot is Jack the Bulldog, a living, breathing dog who over the 200-year history of the school has evolved. But it all started with Sergeant Stubby pushing the football at halftime. And when Stubby retired, a terrier named Hoya, owned by a reverend, became the mascot. And ever since, they have had a dog mascot eventually settling on the bulldog and even the name Jack, donning the dog who graces the field in honor as the mascot of Georgetown University. And while I am sad to see his mascotness was taken over by purebred dogs, given much of his grit, his stubbiness, was that he was a dog of unknown origin and descent, very American. It is neat to see that he started the 200-year tradition of football and dogs. Go Hoyas! James Robert Conroy was tapped as a special agent in the Bureau of Investigation, the arm of the government that eventually became the FBI. And this happened while he was still a student at Georgetown. And for nearly a decade after the war, until his death in 1926, Stubby was the most famous animal in the United States. And when he died at the age of 11, his body was preserved and still able to be seen with Cher Ami, the pigeon, at the Smithsonian Museum in D.C. His cremated ashes are laid inside of his body, and the war vest with all of his medals and the achievements he earned during and after the war is on display for you to see whenever COVID is done with us. But if you don't want to wait, you can search for Sergeant Stubby on Atlas Obscura, SmithsonianMagazine.com, and other places to see photos of this hardy, tough little Boston Bull Terrier or Pit Bull Terrier or Staffordshire mix, or maybe just a Labrador gone horribly wrong. No one knew what he was. And my point is that it doesn't matter. This dog had a heart of fire and loyalty that only those who have ever walked this earth with a dog of this caliber could ever begin to know. Stubby's obituary, the write-up of his life, was in the New York Times and took up a half a page. This is much longer than most people who have ever had an obituary in the New York Times for this era. Stubby's likeness is used to teach kids about war, kindness to animals, and the human-animal bond, and what animals can do to help humans. He was a very good boy indeed. And the fact that I did not know before researching today, according to the Atlas Obscura, dogs in the military are always given one rank above their handler. And this is to make certain that the dogs are respected as partners in the military. If the soldiers abuse or neglect or don't listen to their dogs, which is particularly important with, like, bomb detection work, the soldiers would be punished as they would not be listening to a superior officer. And if you have Hulu, you can stream Sergeant Stubby and the animated film based on the life of this iconic hero dog as of October 2020. Thank you. 
common phobia warning. As we do talk about animals, there are a few that are scarier and maybe even trigger some involuntary fear response in some people. And that's okay. I also have a phobia, and I love animals. And I'll probably talk about it in more depth in another episode, but we are going into our trigger warning on the danger noodle. Nope, ropes, snacks, or snakes. Ophidiophobia, scared of snakes, or herpetophobia, an easier word to say, fear of reptiles, are very common. And if this is you, there is no shame and no shade. So if you need to bounce, no worries. I'll see you next week with 100% fewer snakes. But for those who are still here and are fascinated by this subject, let's keep going. In 2018, a Texas man was surprised to find out that a dead rattlesnake can still bite and kill you. I mean, he didn't die, but he could have. No, this was not a zombie snake attack. It turns out that snake bite reflexes in venomous snakes is so strong. It's strong enough for it to bypass the brain and just respond to movements like being picked up that even after the head is separated from the body and the snake has been dead for hours, the reflex can still be triggered resulting in a bite. And in this particular case, an emergency flight to a hospital for anti-venom where the poor victim stayed reportedly for at least a week. According to National Geographic, treat dead snakes like living ones with extreme caution. Because even if you do not trigger the bite reflex, you might still snag your finger on their poisonous fangs. Better yet, just call an expert to remove it for you. Snakes, while absolutely terrifying and poisonous in some cases, though I personally, I love snakes, they do help ecosystems and they play an important role in environments. So live and let live. Most snakes will just leave you alone if you do not engage. They are shy and generally avoid people. Unless they have no choice, like when we poke them with sticks, walk towards them, or do whatever dumb thing of the week we saw on a YouTube challenge. So if you think of snakes as a terrifying little danger noodle, or my favorite, adorable little nope ropes, you can change your entire perception, if you're not phobic, by checking the board panda link in the description of today's episode. Snakes with hats. While I don't often suggest going to Reddit because it can go terribly wrong, I would suggest to check out this subreddit, Snakes with Hats. There are these little snakes with top hats, bowler hats, Chiquita banana hats, cowboy hats, little Easter bunny hats, ears, whatever, y'all. Snakes with hats is amazing and the good thing in the world that we all need. I mean, that is unless you're afraid of snakes and then I'm so, so sorry. But snakes, hats... So cute! So thanks for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing today on the podcast, know of any historical animals who change the world, animals who help humans, if you have a snake in a hat, or know of any wacky animals in the news, please send them in to bewilderbeastspod at gmail.com. Tweet a Bewildered Pod, Bewilder Beast Pod on Facebook, and Bewilder Beasts on Instagram. I do put up like little promotional things up there, so if you want to check them out, I would love you forever for it. I am Melissa McHugh McGrath, author of Considerations for the City Dog, co training director of the New England Dog Training Club, and Mud Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from Slate.com, Atlas Obscura, Wikipedia.org. Goo Hoyas. Go, goo? G U H O Y A S. Oh, I get it. Georgetown University Hoyas. GooHoyas.com. The Instagram page for Cool History Kids. Smithsonian Mag. NationalGeographic.com. BoardPanda.com. And the subreddit, Snakes with Hats. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. Every little bit helps, and I am so thankful for each and every one of you who listen. 
thank you so much for listening.